All right, can you? Is that good? Can you hear me now? Yep. Thank you, right. Nala, for going. Same. I, I just want to hear what you have to, to say. So just go <laughs> ahead. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for the invitation. I want to, at the outset, thank Pilou and, and the uh, uh, and Birte and, and, and the Amsterdam group for, for putting this together in a challenging time and, and bringing together some really top notch people. You know, the, the program was really exciting. And, and from the last talk, judging from the last talk, I think we're going to be in for a treat. Um, I'm particularly excited to be in this session, given the speakers in it. Uh, in particular, I, I'm, I'm happy to play the setup for, for John Lau, who's coming up next, who I've known for a very long time uh, when we were both at the MNI training. Um, so, uh, so thanks again for, for putting this all together. Uh, the work I'm going to be talking about today specifically um, is really, the, you know, works against the backdrop of a number of papers that we've worked on over the years on developing, uh, you know, histology-based atlases, uh, using those histology-based atlases and um, segmentation frameworks, uh, such as multi-atlas frameworks, and validating them against different uh, existing methods. I'm not going to be talking too much about these methods today. I'm, I'm going to try to focus on some newer work, but but certainly these are the papers that that describe the the stuff beneath the hood uh, that I'll be talking about today. And I'll I'll try to talk about some of the more technical aspects a bit more generally. But but feel free to ask me about any of that during the question period or or um, if you need more clarity, you know, please feel to me, ask me about that in the question period as well. Um, so, you know, a lot of the work, as you can see from the titles here, have, have worked in, um, have involved working in the striatum pallidus and the thalamus, and that's gonna be the focus of, of this talk today. I'm just gonna go to my laser pointer. Uh, so here in red, um, the focus of the talk today, and, and I'll be talking about some newer work that we've been doing there. Um, but first, uh, I'll talk about um, kind of how we got there, and this is work you know, this is a famous picture by now. We have maps like this for the cortex. And anyone, anytime anyone talks about uh, the change in brain structure over the course of the lifespan or the developmental trajectory, you know, this is one of the first images that comes up demonstrating decreased gray matter volume in the cortex over the developmental period from five to 20 years old. So we took kind of the, so one of the first projects we ever did looking mapping kind of a larger data set with our tools, uh, we did in collaboration with Dr. Armin Reznahan, who's at the NIMH, um, looking at this similar data, similar part of this data set and examining over 1300 volumes in this data set to examine, which at the time was a novel idea, um, you know, considering it was only, which is a bit shocking considering it was only seven, eight years ago, uh, to examine uh, the developmental time course of the subcortical structures using about 1300 MRI volumes from over 600 individuals. And what we found in this paper uh, was a bit surprising to us was that uh, one, you know, if you take the canonical trajectories of the cortex, uh, which I guess stereotypically have been um, resolved to have this kind of developmental peak happening early in the lifespan, but if you take into account more modern papers, it's probably more likely to be a, a, a monotonic decline in, in gray matter volume over the period of the, um, of the developmental trajectory. But nonetheless, if you examine the striatum, the pallidum, and the thalamus in relation to the cortex, what you do see is that you get this increase in hippocamp, uh, striatal or palatal thalamic volume. And then in, the, in particular, in the case of the striatum and the thalamus, you get this peak volume attained uh, at the age of, you know, in, in mid-adolescence, so at age 14 or 15, um, which is, you know, quite different from what we see in, in, in the cortex. So suggesting that uh, the brain subcortically has a different uh, developmental trajectory than potentially the subcortex, uh, than the cortex. Uh, However, we, within the algorithms that we have and the, within the algorithms we've developed, we've been able to create these surface mapping techniques, which uh, in this particular case, create the kind of homologue of, you know, say surface area expansion or contraction that one would see on the cortex. So here we map that map down to about say 5,000 vertices on the striatum, about 2,000 on the pallidum and three or 4,000 on the thalamus. And what you can see is that even though, sorry, if you go back here and you see, you know, these, these volumetric trajectories, you'd be pretty hard pressed to convince yourself or me, that there's much going on past this, you know, age 11 or 12 point, you know, and this, this point uh, that peak demarcates peak volume attained, uh, you know, is, is much more than a placeholder. So we asked the question, does the, uh, does the shape profile as indexed by the aerial expansion of vertices based on the surface area of the, of the polygons that make up the mesh, um, can that be used as another descriptor for what's going on in the, 
uh, in the subcortex. And indeed, if you if you examine the trajectory, this is a movie. Uh, can I? Why there we go. It's a movie mapping that uh, shape trajectory from ages of five to twenty-five. And what you see is that even though volume stays relatively stable past the age of ten or so, like I showed in the previous slide, you have these contractions anteriorly, for example, in the striatum, uh, and these expansions in red uh, at different parts of of um, of the striatum as well, in the cardiac, the patamen. So suggesting that um, you know, interestingly, what you have here is uh, these local uh, morphometric variations that can potentially be obscured by, by looking at more traditional measures such as bulk, bulk volume. Um, and so in, pre in, in work since then, we've examined this further. And this is my PhD student, Stephanie Tullo, uh, who actually did this as part of her master's degree um, in uh, the integrated program in neuroscience in, at McGill. And we wanted to see, can we extend these uh, notions past uh, the developmental period to the entire lifespan. So this is data that we collected in house. And here what you see is potentially not all that surprising. You have volumetric trajectories where you see a monotonic decrease in the left and right striatum, uh, even though you have a curvy linear trajectory, but still you, you see the decrease in volume over time, whether you account for total brain volume or not. Uh, Paldum, you see this kind of straight line uh, trajectory. And the thalamus, you see maybe this partial preservation of the volume until age 40, followed by a more steep decline uh, later on in the lifespan. In this paper, however, I think the, the, the more novel aspects of this paper, we're examining some other measure, measures, such as the T1 over T2 measure, which you know, I know is potentially somewhat controversial, but we'll call it a, a measure of microstructure or myelin for the purposes of this talk. And again, I'd be happy to talk about that and, and its specificity later on in the talk. But for the purposes of what I want to get across, we'll just talk, we'll, we'll index it as microstructure or myelin. But interestingly here, you see a very different trajectory in the mean uh, T1 over T2 across structures. So if we take the striatum again, what you see here, and maybe this is hope for all of us, for those of us rounding into middle age, while the brain volume is decreasing um, as a function of age, you see this, um, this peak in this microstructural measure at around 50 years old. And then this you know, wild increase in variability as one gets uh, a bit older in the age trajectory, right? Um, so this is very different and maybe potentially complementary to the volume measures that I showed before. And if we go back to the shape measures, here we see, uh, again, these kind of differential regions of uh, aerial expansion as indexed by surface area and aerial contraction as indexed by surface area uh, up, uh, between different compartments of the stride. So if you put all that, to, now this is true of uh, different parts of the the subcortical regions like the thalamus and the pallidum, like I mentioned before, but I'm not going to show that here just in the interest of time. But what it did lead me to believe was that if we take different measurements of uh, from our MRI volumes, how do we then put them together? How do we then reconcile these different pathways and different trajectories uh, that we're observing if we apply different metrics, right? And this is kind of one of the things that happens a lot in MRI. You get a new fancy toy and then you're, you're uh, tendency is to see how far you can take that toy with while excluding or over interpreting one of the metrics that you have right so and it's one of the fabulous things about MRIs that you can get these different contracts contrasts which are by and large um, uh, rather sensitive but non-specific and so I think it's only by putting them together that we can really uncover some maybe some more interesting fundamental uh, aspects of the subcortical architecture. And that's the that's going to be the basis of the next 20 minutes of my talk. Um, if I can move slides, of course. There we go. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about two different uh, projects that we've been working on in the lab as a means of maybe unraveling these different aspects of subcortical morphology and microstructure. The first is going to be examining the genetic and evolutionary underpinnings of the subcortical morphology. Uh, and the second is going to be looking using a multi-contrast and multivariate characterization of the subcortical structure as a means of potentially getting a better understanding of the underlying signature uh, and increasing the specificity um, of the different subcortical compartments. So the first part here uh, is work done by Nadia Blostein, who's been working on this for, for some time now uh, as a function of uh, an honors thesis and, and her master's degree. Uh, and, and one thing we've been interested in is... Uh, you know, we started by just looking at the aggregate heritability 
of subcortical volume, right? So I know this is an obscenely busy slide and I will walk you through it, uh, not column by column, but in groups of columns. So these groups of columns that you see in three, uh, moving from left to right, are examining the uh, striatal heritability from left and right, thalamic uh, heritability and the globus pallidus heritability left and right, as well as the total brain volume heritability. As far as brain structures go, total brain volume heritability is pretty rock solid. Um, it's about, um, you know, it's, it's, it's the body weight or the height equivalent of brain structures in terms of its reproducibility in terms of heritability measures. And you see here that it's heritable, you know, just at about 80-85%, uh, meaning that, you know, 85% of the variance explained in that measure can be explained by uh, heritability. And I, I should back up and say that for these, um, for the heritability in these measures, we use the data from the Human Connectome Project. Um, so about a thousand individuals, and we used the ACE model using OpenMX, um, uh, comprising uh, the monozygotic, monozygotic twins, the dizygotic twins, and then the siblings, uh, the non-twin siblings that are available through the Human Connectome Project data set. So if you look uh, from left to right, and you look, we, we for, for each of these kind of triads of columns, what you see is that we have a column here, we look at the heritability adjusted for sex and age. We tried to examine, uh, does heritability, how, how much is it impacted by just total brain volume? So we adjusted again for sex, age, and total brain volume. And then we looked at the bivariate heritability, which looks at the covariance, the heritability of the covariance between these two measures. And what you see is that by and large, uh, most of the subcortical structures have a very high heritability uh, as indexed by their overall volume. Uh, regardless of how you kind of visualize the, the measures. Um, you know, analogous to or above and beyond what you would expect from looking at the total brain volume. Um, so this was not necessarily too much of a surprise for us looking at other data and looking at other data that's in the literature. But what we wanted to do was now use this idea to look at the local morphological properties that we had indexed and, and had seen of being of relevance in our neurodevelopmental studies. So. Here, this is just kind of, again, a mesh representation of this of our striatum. And we looked at, oh, this is not a great resolution image, sorry. I did this on my laptop yesterday and it looked better. Um, uh, but what you see here, so yellow, yellow uh, vertices in yellow here are 100% heritable. These dark blue and dark purple uh, vertices are, um, are you know, much less heritable. And what you see is you have this patterning of heritability that extends you know, anterior to posterior across the entire striatum in this case. And so these regions in yellow at the, um, you know, at, at the anterior portion, close to the accumbens, uh, both in front and back are highly heritable, but these more lateral regions and dorsal regions as well are less heritable. So, there, so even though, again, we see that uh, the overall volume is quite heritable, if you localize this with respect to the more salient morphological properties, you see this deferential patterning, patterning in the heritability of, um, of the, of the subcortical region. So kind of as Pilu was alluding to before in the introduction to the session, you know, if, if we take a more fine grained approach to how we map the subcortical regions, we might start uncovering different things. And so we wanted to ask the question, okay, is this true one for all the regions of the subcortical structures? And indeed it is, you have this differential heritability. I should mention here that these regions in gray or in steel are regions that do not survive multiple comparisons correction. Um, and nonetheless, what we get is this kind of differential patterning uh, across um, the thalamus, the globus pallidus, and the striatum, right? So suggesting that uh, there's some regions that, you know, if, if analogous to the cortex, um, you know, regions that are less heritable are potentially more plastic and can be, um, uh, you know, more malleable to, to cognitive training or or, or new experiences. And this is something that we're actively pursuing and examining uh, right now. Uh, we are looking at kind of do more, do less heritable regions. For example, they map onto more sophisticated uh, cognitive tasks that are available in the HCP and our, our findings for that are mixed. The other thing we wanted to do too was examine this as a function of evolution and in the context of evolution. And so we did this uh, using uh, some new data that we've uh, been working with in the lab, and this is work that's been spearheaded by Gabriel Deveni, where we looked at uh, about 140 or 150 MRIs uh, from chimpanzees, and we created, um, you know, basically the analogous of the ic 152 or the MNI space template, but for uh, chimpanzee data. And the goal was, 
you know, so this is a representation of, of that template um, and, and uh, some work on that is in prep looking at the variability in the chimpanzee anatomy uh, and how it relates to the variability in the human anatomy. And that's maybe a bit out of scope for this talk, but it's exciting stuff that I'd love for you guys to keep your eyes out for. Um, but what we were able to do was use the same registration strategies where we were able to map the subcortical regions from the human uh, to the chimp and vice versa. So creating kind of an intermediate template space using the ant template builder uh, create, to create what we've been affectionately calling the human chimp hybrid. So, uh, you know, basically we're making uh, monkey human brains uh, in the lab at, at this point uh, using kind of these registration parameters. Um, and what's nice about the subcortical regions is that, you know, by and large, there's a pretty nice homology to be had unlike cortical folds uh, between subcortical structures. And when we do that, you can get a map that looks a bit like this. So here, what you get is uh, as a proportion, uh, what regions are expanding as a function of the mapping from human to chimp, uh, from chimp to human, sorry, uh, and vice versa. So the chimpanzee uh, stratum to map onto the human stratum needs to increase locally by about 50% uh, in the aerial surface area in these regions and these darker regions, up to 50% of these darker regions that you see um, in red. But there's there this there is this preferential contraction in other regions, right? So it's not this homologous, you know, if you account for total brain volume, it's not this homologous kind of like inflation of the surface area. It really is this um, regionally specific adaptation that allows uh, the striatum to at least anatomically be mapped from the chimpanzee to the human. So uh, with you now in, in the cortex, what people have observed, what, what different groups have observed is that uh, um, regions that are, are less heritable expand more um, and vice versa. So we wanted to see using these mappings, can we then apply these, uh, this idea to the subcortical structures? And indeed, uh, this is new data and I'd love to get any opinions on this uh, as one could. So these are the correlations, uh, both the Spearman and the Pearson correlation uh, in orange and in blue uh, in these columns here. This is the correlation value on the left-hand side. And on the, going along the right is the left stratum, the right stratum, the thalamus and the pallidum. And what we see by and large is this modest correlation between the heritability maps and these maps of human expansion. And these, uh, these modest correlations again are inversely correlated. So suggesting again, that these regions that are highly heritable go through contraction and vice versa. Um, and this is something, again, that we're uh, trying to better understand. Um, so for example, what is the connectivity profile of these regions that are, um, that, that, that are both less heritable and uh, have these differential properties and uh, uh, expansion and contraction? Um, so you know, I'm going gonna, gonna to kind of transition here. And these are the partial conclusions for this part of my talk. Uh, one. Uh, some cortical vol volumes are potentially, not so surprisingly, highly heritable. Uh, two, um, the localized morphology measures demonstrate a topologically specific patterning of heritability. So just because the volumes are very heritable doesn't mean the overall structure is, and there is this kind of finer grain gradient in the heritability of our subcortical structures. And three, there are some putative uh, inverse correlations between regions of high heritability and structure specific uh, involvement in the aerial expansion going from chimpanzee to human. And these are areas of, of further exploration for me in the lab. So I'm gonna transition here to the next part of the talk. Uh, we'll be talking about multi-contrast and the multivariate characterization work we've been doing of subcortical structures. And uh, Pilou talked about um, the Glasser and Van Essen parcellations uh, a little bit earlier on in, in the introduction to the session. And a lot of this work was really inspired by that, right? Um, you know, so if anyone's looked at that initial parcellation, uh, it's just really, you know, fantastic work involving, involving, you know, a combination between manual delineation and automatic delineation to kind of demonstrate that you can recapitulate potentially more, um, more reliably some of the well-known cortical parcellations in the brain, but also uncover some brand new ones if and only if you combine uh, measures that are functional, structural, and potentially myelin-based. Again, this T1 over T2 measure that comes up again. 
So uh, we were, you know, I've, we looked at this paper a lot in the lab and we were heavily inspired by it. I, you know, it's, it's one of the, the great and, and, and obviously one of the, the motivations for providing the human connectome brain uh, project data is to be able to dive into these data in this multimodal type way. And it led us to develop this work in the human hippocampus, uh, which was recently published by Rehan Patel, who's a very senior PhD student in the lab and, and just about to finish. And instead of having any human intervention, our goal was to kind of combine metrics from uh, the human connectome project, but do it in a very much an observer independent type way. Uh, we originally applied this data, this methodology to the hippocampus, but I'm gonna to talk to you here about uh, a recent uh, extrapolation of this technique to uh, the human striatum and what it's allowed to, just to uncover uh, about maybe the underlying microstructure of the striatum. And so for this, we've been using um, a lot of the microstructural data that come from the human connectome data. And we used, uh, I'll, I'll tell you the which data we use from the human connectome data to do this work. The first again is our putative marker myelin uh, as indexed by the T1 over T2 measure. Uh, the second are the fractional anisotropy maps, uh, which I'm sure everyone knows, but I'll do it you know, in a very hand wavy way. Um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a nice marker of potentially myelin, but of more, more likely axonal density and axonal organization. And then a mean diffusivity, uh, which is a voxwise average of the water diffusion in a compartment. Uh, and it's been known to correlate to cell density and myelin as well. So the idea would be that by, you know, there is, as you can see myelin shows up in all these measures. And the idea would be that by combining these, we get um, a more fine grained and nuanced definition of uh, the overall microstructure uh, in the subcortical regions uh, in a more data-driven way than what was previously done by the Human Connectome Project. Um, so here we used unrelated males and females uh, from the Human Connectome Project, so no twins at all. Uh, uh, and we had about 350 individuals that we used to do this work. So this work that was, uh, you know, heavily supervised by Rayhan Patel and um, and and done by uh, a now research assistant in the lab named Corinne Robert. And the goal was, can we oh, can we again stack up these multimodal metrics to, to create some sort of decomposition of the striatal anatomy? And for this, we used a technique that we've been favoring in the lab since the publication of Rayhan's initial paper called non-negative matrix factorization. So we're not you know, certainly not a technique that's novel to our lab. It's a technique that was um, favored by uh, Aris Satiris uh, when he worked with Christos Stavatsikos at UPenn. Uh, and he continues to work on this me uh, method on at, at um, in his new uh, position at Vanderbilt. And uh, it's also a method that's been championed by Sarah Ganon as well to, to look at uh, the different um, uh, elements of, to decompose the structure of the hippocampus and, the, and, and other subcortical regions. Here, I think the real novelty of our work is by, that we were able to stack up, uh, that we've been adapting the work to stack up the different, micro, different modalities, in this case, the microstructural regions uh, by subjects. And the way in which we do the decomposition gives us two matrices. One is a voxel-wise uh, metric, matrix, which gives you a weight at each voxel um, uh, across a number of user-defined components. Uh, and then we can look at how each of these components you get a specific contribution from the T1 over T2 measure, uh, the FA measure or the MD measure across all the different subjects that we're analyzing in our data set. Uh, we're using a variant of this methodology called the orthonormal project projective variant, which means that each voxel now preferentially uh, basically weights onto a specific component. Uh, although it has contributions across the other different components that we estimate, it's uh, the, the methodology prioritizes parsimony. Uh, so you basically have, um, you can use kind of a winner take all strategy, uh, which allows us then to wait, to map each voxel to a specific component. Um, uh, the, other, the other innovation that we've made uh, is kind of creating standardized measures for estimation of the stability. So unlike other matrix decomposition techniques, you know, one of the big questions when we use matrix decomposition techniques is, well, how many PCs do we use or how many latent variables do we use? Here, um, the, the number of components that are output are user defined. Um, and so here we, we, we basically do a scan across the number of components and we look at the stability using cosine similarity, uh, which is the curve that you see up top in red. So higher, closer to one, 
uh, is more stable. Um, and of course, the lower number of components you have, the more stable that you, you have, um, uh, um, the more stable the number of components that you get out over a split half type of analysis. Um, and then we can also look at the gradient reconstruction error, the gradient of the reconstruction error. And so the bigger the jump uh, uh, demonstrates that um, there is a stability to be had kind of here. We chose uh, five components, but you could have made a case for four uh, potentially as well. We just, uh, we went with five, but it does, it does, you know, what we find when we go from four to five is we, we get a nice kind of segregation between components. So um, even though this is somewhat quantitative, there is, you know, a bit of dark art here as well as with the choosing of any number of components um, in a, in a data-driven method. And so this is what we get out. Uh, and these are the five different data-driven components that we, we derive from our data. So this is just a 3D surface rendering uh, developed by Corinne. Uh, the components here are color-coded uh, from one to component one through five. And this is their spatial localization as you march anteriorly to posterior from uh, the subcortex to the cortex. So you get really nice chunks of the cardiac vitamin here in this kind of violet color. Um, the accumbens is nicely de delineated bilaterally in this orange color. And what I find really enticing about this is that um, this is the left stratum and this is the right stratum. Uh, we did this separately in the left and the right, and you get this really nice symmetry between the decompositions that we get out. So, okay, this is nice. Uh, we get, you know, kind of this data-driven parcellation of the stratum. Uh, you know, the question is, what does it really mean? And so, uh, as I mentioned before, here you have... Uh, the subjects per, per metric uh, organized uh, for each metric that we used from left to right. Uh, and here you have the different components moving forward here. And here is a relative weighting uh, of each subject on each component by measure, right? So some inferences that we can make right off the top is that uh, component one is richer in myelin. Component two uh, has greater axonal uh, um, directionality, which is is not terribly surprising given its um, kind of situation as a superficial measure. If you look at component four, uh, it's really about FA and MD um, in this accumbens region. The next thing we wanted to check is, okay, does this have any behavioral mapping? Uh, and we didn't necessarily have any a priori's on the types of behavior uh, that we thought it would map to. So we, we did a scan on the human connectome project data um, uh, on what we thought would be striatum related behaviors. Um, and so here we have uh, the microstructure component pair um, in one matrix and the behavioral variables in another, another matrix. And what we chose to do was decompose this further to find microstructural signatures, basically using partial least squares, um, which basically gives you link patterns of Bain and behavior covariance in a latent variable. And I'm gonna go over one such latent variable because there's not a lot of time left. Um, uh, but we did examine kind of the, um, the robustness of these of these latent variables using um, uh, using various permutation tests and, and bootstrap resampling. And so the first latent variable accounts for on the left hand stratum, for example, accounts for 57% of the covariance. Uh, it's very much an age, even though we have a very restricted age range. Uh, it's an age related um, uh, latent variable, uh, preferentially loading onto uh, males. Uh, which is interesting because what we see is this uh, relationship with strength and endurance, which is kind of uh, stereotypically a more uh, uh, male related trait. Uh, and uh, the flanker task, which um, maps on to um, basically the, the ability to, to, to ignore external stimuli during a task. Um, so we do get this kind of interesting mapping across, you know, different components and their relative the relative contribution of the different microstructural measures. And the time that uh, remains, I'm gonna talk a little bit about, um, so this is kind of the, the unique signature that we get um, by combining these measures. We also get some kind of um, confirmation of other measures that have been proposed in the, or other from other studies that have been examined in the field. So for example, if you look at Catherine Abel's really beautiful work of examining um, the, the microstructural properties of the caught in the containment, uh, as a function of age, you see this decrease in mean diffusivity, you know, in our case, effectively across almost the entire stratum as a function of age. Uh, and this, this, this uh, um, provides a really nice confirmation of, of these previous work by Catherine LaBelle. We also see 
more or less this um, kind of maybe more compartment specific uh, signature of fractional isotropy um, in component four, two, and one uh, that that maybe was examined as a more global signature in Catherine LaBelle's previous work. So again, this recapitulates some of the previous work that we find, but also potentially gives it some anatomical specificity that we weren't able to gain before. Uh, finally, we examined uh, the relationship between um, our components and neurosynth. And what we find is that uh, some confirmation of, for example, incentive and reward. So here, the size of the measure of, of, uh, of, of the words is the, the, the strength of the correlation uh, amongst um, functional MRI tasks that have been input in the neurosynth database. Um, and so here we get this nice mapping onto the accumbens. We also get uh, this nice disease related mapping and motor response and control mapping uh, in this purple, uh, on this purple component here that we have here, uh, which is again, a nice validation of the work that we have. However, we get this more general mapping across the different components uh, here that we're trying to uncover a little bit more as well. And we do by and large get similar um, mappings with Neurosynth across the other components on the right stratum again, but we also get, we also lose maybe a bit of the motor response potentially due to the uh, biases and laterality that exist in the, and handedness that exists in the literature. And finally, we do get this age related component uh, mapping onto uh, the screen component here. So finally, uh, just in conclusion, uh, using these microstructural measures, we identify five stratal components for the left and right stratum with a distinct microstructural pattern. We believe at least that these, these give you some kind of combination of patterning uh, of the microstructure with the behavior variability observed, at least in HCP. Um, and they, we do identify uh, some relationships that appear to be functionally relevant based on our, map, our, our examination of the Neurosynth database. So finally, I'd like to thank my lab. Uh, this is Nadia who did all the heritability work. Uh, this is Gabe hiding out in the back here, um, uh, who is often my right and left hand in terms of helping other students and, and computational work. This is Stephanie who did the age-related work that I showed before. Uh, and, and this is Corinne who did a lot of the work in terms of the partial, um, in terms of the NMF. And this is Rayhan who did the original work in the NMF. So with that, I thank you very much. And I'd love to take any questions that you may have. And I apologize for going about two and a half minutes over. Thank you. Stay with me.